We say Environmental Protection Agency and other federal and state partners to promote cleanup uh, and redevelopment of brownfields throughout Connecticut. Mark previously served for 20 years as uh, an environmental analyst in deep uh, prior joining uh, state service. Mark worked uh, as an environmental consultant uh, focusing on assessment and remediation for the water resource division uh, of the United States Ge Geological Survey. Mark is also a fight uh, fighter and squad boss on Deep's uh, interstate wild field crew, uh, which responds to wild wildfire throughout the United States and in Canada. Mark holds BS in ge ge geology uh, from Bats College. Uh, let's welcome Mark Lewis. Thank you. I, we were asked to talk a little bit about what our organization does, and I've worked for about 25 years for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. I would describe us as a full-service environmental agency. It, it probably is not a department of state government that has more breadth and scope to what they do. We do everything from regulating you know, the environment to we have charge of state parks, we have charge of wildlife and fish, and about four years ago they added energy to the Department of Environmental Protection, so now we're the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and one of our responsibilities is providing for more clean energy and just regulating energy. Uh, I'm going to talk today though about a particular project that I think has been really rewarding to be in involved with down in New Haven. First of all, in, in the context of environmental justice, we have a policy on environmental justice which to summarize this, it basically says that nobody should be disproportionately impacted by the negative environmental impacts or environmental effects of things and everybody should equally share in the rewards of the good things that come from the environment. It's much more formal, formal than that and it's backed up by legislation, but that is what it says boiled down. The environmental justice program, which I am not a part of, but I work very closely with, works to help minority communities be less impacted by environmental problems, to share more in the rewards of environmental benefits, and there are statutes that, statutes that say, for example, when a waste facility is going to be located in an environmental justice community, which tends to be places like Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford, Waterbury, that the local people need to have input into the decision making on the permit for that. And if that means having a translator there that speaks whatever language needs to be spoken, uh, we will do that. And Edith Pastana is our environmental justice coordinator. I'm actually kind of pinch hitting for Edith because her daughter is graduating from high school tonight. And Doris Johnson is our other environmental justice person. There's only two of them to do a very big, big job. Mm -hmm. We have found a partnership with the Beulah Land Development Corporation in New Haven, which is a faith-based organization that is associated with the Pentecostal Church in the Dixwell uh, neighborhood of New Haven. Is everybody, is anybody not familiar with New Haven, at least generally? Okay, it's a, well, uh, this is, this is a uh, area of New Haven that is uh, fairly poor. It's predominantly African American, and it is located right near what used to be the Winchester Arms Factory, which went out of business probably 30 or 40 years ago and left a big hole in the environment. Well, the, uh, the Beulah Land Development Corporation was founded about 20 years ago to clean up contaminated properties one at a time, and they have been doing great work in the neighborhood, buying houses, some of which were crack houses and things like that, and cleaning them up and selling them to local residents and working with those local residents to help them be responsible homeowners. The latest project that they've taken on is not just a single house, but they bought an old gas station about 10 years ago, and they're going to clean that gas station up and they're going to buy two more properties that go along with it. And they're going to develop that into about 70 units of affordable housing. 
This is at 340 Dixwell Avenue in New Haven. Dixwell Avenue is one of the main drags that leads from downtown New Haven out to the suburbs of Hamden and Cheshire, which is a little bit further out. And the, the main property, which is 340 Dixwell Avenue on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, was a gas station and uh, dry cleaner. And like I said, Beulah bought it about 10 years ago. They have done a, a great deal of assessment work on the site, and they plan to clean it up using grants from, from the state and from the city of New Haven. The property in the middle is a residence that was also a barber shop, and the property on the left-hand side of your screen was an auto body shop, which the city of New Haven is currently using for educational purposes, but the city is going to sell that also to them. They're going to knock down the two remaining buildings, and they're going to build what I think is a really neat 70-unit apartment building that's going to use what they call mass timber construction. Mass timber is using instead of building things out of two-by-fours on site well, with, with hammer and nails, you use lumber that is built in a factory someplace, it can be built to really any shape and then it's assembled on site. And it's all laminated together like plywood, only thicker. And one of the benefits of this is that they're going to train local people in jobs in mass timber. And another benefit of this is rather than hauling lumber from very, very far away, they're hoping to get factories set up much more close by to help produce the laminated timber. And there will be about 70 units of housing. 80% of them will be affordable. 20% of them will be market rate. And one of the lessons from this is the, the guy on the left is Daryl Brooks. He is the executive director of the Beulah Land Development Corporation. He just retired from the New Haven Fire Department after many, many years. And he is a very passionate advocate for this project. And they had a meeting back about a month ago to, to introduce this project to local residents. And you can see the gentleman on the right. Just look at the expression on his face at how, at how happy and enthusiastic he is. I mean, that, I think that kind of says it all. This is a community that is, has been underserved and upper, underrepresented for years and years. And this is going to be transformative in this neighborhood. Some of the lessons that come from not just this project, but Brownfield's projects in general, I won't read these all out, but if you were to summarize these, these all sound a lot to me like the beliefs of the major religions of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and really to treat others with respect and be respectful to yourself, be respectful to the environment. And Something that I just added this morning was be optimistic. You can't do this kind of work unless you are an optimist. There's all kinds of bad things happening in the world, admittedly, but you can either be a glasses half empty person or you can be a glasses half full person. Having optimism is tremendously helpful in, in this and just engaging the community. And something I didn't put in the slides, but I will say to you, is that if you're trying to engage community, one of the best things that you can do is to serve food to people. And I, I say that as a person that loves to eat. I appreciated the meal here. But I say that in all seriousness, because if you break bread with people, it can really bridge barriers and can make people much more willing to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. And this is the contact information for me and for my colleagues, Edith and Doris, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have questions in the future. Thank you. Uh, we will start now uh, our further discussion to uh, have more information and uh, knowledge. And if you would like to share with a question, please prepare this. But let me start with my questions. So it is for all of you. Uh, we can see that we have a lot of uh, changes in US, uh, United States administrations. Uh, has the current political situation or administration uh, affected your work during the, this last uh, years? That, that's my question. Yeah, um, we, we have a lot of changes now in the United States administration. Uh, and I wonder about 
does this changes, uh, do these changes affect uh, the work of this organization uh, or this agencies or not? Um, maybe I can respond to that because uh, uh, the reason I wanted to respond to your question is I've seen this before. Back in the early 80s when uh, Ronald Reagan became our president, he also selected people to run our agencies and Gorsuch became the head of EPA, James Watts became the head of uh, Department uh, Interior, and we saw the same thing happening, trying to unravel all the, uh, all the regulations and laws that were adopted by uh, their predecessors. Even Nixon was a greater environmentalist than you know, most people take him out to be. He actually founded EPA by stitching together many federal agencies. So when our current president became, uh, took office, I felt the same feeling when he selected Scott Pruitt to become EPA head and Zing he became the head of, uh, I said, but there's a difference now. Uh, it was bad enough then. It's much worse today. Much, much worse. I kept hoping that history will repeat itself because I worked for an organization in NRDC back in the early 80s and we were, you know, uh, a group of um, scientists and environmental lawyers. We brought a lot of lawsuits. We stopped some of the worst, uh, uh, you might say, acts by the federal agency then. We don't see that today. I mean, it's also happening. People don't realize how many lawsuits have been filed by environmental organizations to stop. You cannot unravel a regulation once it's placed because you have got to go to something called the Administrative Procedures Act, which means you have to have hearings, you have to go through the whole process. So there are ways to stop the worst of it. But the feeling in this country right now, and I'm not sure this is working anymore, uh, is one of, well, you were saying about, no, don't um, be optimistic. And I agree with that. In fact, I wrote something down here earlier. I thought you, I might have to project myself. Acting urgently as if what we do still matters, not giving in to despair. I want to make sure that that point got across. Even though things look bleak, don't give in to despair. And everything, little things you do, recycling or whatever you do, it all still matters. It still is important for you to do that nevertheless. So that's one, one, one point I want to make. I'd love to follow up on that and, and also add that uh, I think one of the important roles of faith communities here uh, is to draw on the spiritual disciplines and wisdom of our tradition to sustain ourselves in what is and has been a long fight. In my tradition, the terms are faith, hope, hope, and love. Um, so um, it, it is very important, I think, for us as, as the faith community to be engaged on that level. It has affected our work on the state level, and I want to sort of underscore a point that was made here, because I worked as a lawyer for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection during the George W. Bush administration, where the government was literally owned lock, stock, and barrel by the energy industry. It wasn't as bad as it is now, but the work at the state and the local level goes on through all of that. And there are many lawsuits, as we in Massachusetts sued the federal government then uh, to block transboundary pollution, and the states just won another suit against the EPA last week. And there are many, many lawsuits throughout the country, including on um, uh, the, the withdrawal from the Paris Accord. The main way that it has affected us is it's, it's created a greater sense of urgency at the state and local level. And it has, it has generated more of a response from the faith communities and the local activists. Now, every state's going to be a little bit different 
in Massachusetts, the head of my denomination, the United Church of Christ, has been arrested multiple times, including circling the White House in opposition to the Keystone Pipeline. And the United Church of Christ has just joined with the Connecticut and Rhode Island conferences and formed a nonprofit organization for the explicit purpose of promoting a progressive agenda. So the faith community is stepping up. You know, as I said, we are now working to engage the Catholic Church as much as possible. Uh, the other faith communities are stepping up. Um, and I think what we need to do is take advantage of this energy and build coalitions, broader coalitions than the coalitions that we already have, because this is going to be a bottom-up change. Yes. Okay? So, you know, like I said, I worked <laughs> as a lawyer in the state bureaucracy, so I'm familiar with that world, and we did good work there, and I did enforcement cases against British Petroleum, General Motors, Terrell at Swarovski. That work continues, but this is going to need to be a bottom-up uh, process, which is why we're doing more community organization, and we need to work together across lines that in the past have divided us. Yes. I, I want to say I, I agree with you 100% um, 100 on that. Uh, not too long ago, the group uh, Eco America, you may have heard of Eco, Eco America, Eco America did a poll and found that it's between 10 and 13% of individuals within congregations in the United States have heard the word climate change mentioned, period. That's it. So we're talking 87 to 90 percent of congregation in the United States, they do not talk about it. This is, you know, this is the existential crisis. We have never faced this before as human beings. I'm not optimistic. I'm hopeful, <laughs> but I'm not optimistic. But for me, it's, it's the urgency. It's the urgency. And I, I'm a local, I'm a local pastor. I've been a pastor for 35 years. And I know you, you know, pastors get flack for preaching on controversial things. Look, this is life and death. And it, it's, you know, earth is our home. It's the only one we got. And we are earthlings. And we're connected all one to another. And so, and so climate change, species extinction, the spread of toxins, it, it affects everything and it affects, it, it affects us. And so I would say with, with the election, it, it, it's the urgency uh, in, many, in many congregations has, has in, increased, but in many they still don't talk about it. Not to, not to hog the mic, but let me just say, I, I think there is, I think it, it has generated some more discouragement and despair. Uh, and that's, as I said before, why I think our role in the faith community, uh, where our traditions, uh, certainly in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, it's one of, you know, freeing from slave, being freed from from slavery and oppression, and and helping the foreigner and the oppressed is is, is really important for us to to, yeah. to step forward and take the lead. Mm -hmm. Mark, I would agree with the other speakers about the events of the last year and a half or two years creating a greater sense of urgency. I would say, that, however, that if you don't know uh, Gina McCarthy, who was the head of the Environmental Protection Agency under the last part of the Obama administration, before she worked at EPA, she was our commissioner at the Department of Environmental Protection. And she was a, a pretty exceptional leader, a very, very inspiring person. If, if you want, if you need a shot of optimism, just listen to one of Gina's speeches and about two or three months ago she was back in Connecticut speaking and she now works at Harvard and her take on all of this was first of all being around young people at a place like Harvard is very inspiring she says that the young people are not going to put up with all of the baloney that's going on and like a lot of movements that have come before the environmental movement it starts with young people she also says that this all of the stuff that's going on is creating that sense of urgency. She basically says, this too shall pass, and in some ways this is probably waking a lot of people up who've become very complacent with some of the 
early successes of the environmental movement and realizing that not everybody thinks the same way that people that care about the environment do and that we need to work with other people, educate people, all of that stuff. But hers was a very just optimistic and hopeful message. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's open the, the, the question for you, if you'd like to, yeah, let's, let's start from, yeah, we have a mic here, yeah. Dr. Huda, yeah, yeah, it's here, just behind. Okay, assalamu alaikum, uh, this is uh, Huda Al-Kaf, I'm with Wisconsin Green Muslims, and I'm a scientist, and um, I just want to us to discuss about this uh, bridging between the faith community and the scientific community. Because this is something that I dedicated my, a whole part of my life for it. Um, and I believe this is urgent as well, that we could move together. We need both uh, aspects, the spiritual and the scientific community to come together. And I see that happening in the U.S. Climate Action Network. This is happening. It's scientists and faith communities are coming together. We are moving together um, to address the climate change uh, problem. We have a climate uh, change network in the Midwest. We are also moving together. The faith community and the scientific community are all together in it. So I see that happening, and I want it to be more, ha see that more happening. But it, it has to come from both sides. Like the scientists have to open up to the faith community, and the faith community have to be persistent to demand their place in those spaces. And that's what I've been doing. Like Wisconsin Green Muslims have been the only organization in Wisconsin that now have a seat in the environmental consortium. We are the first faith community that's been part of the board of directors of the environmental consortium in Wisconsin. Because why did that happen? Because of our demand. <laughs> we care and we want to be part of that uh, conversation. Um, so it ha that's what I wanted to mention, is that for both of us to be, to be there because we need each other. So I wanted to um, explore, I mean, I want to hear from you if, uh, how do you see this going forward in your states, in your conditions? Uh, I mean. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed and appreciated your presentation last evening. I was very impressed by what you have been able to achieve in, uh, um, in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, even though you have a terrible uh, governor, I don't know how he managed to do it. <laughs> uh, I mean, he was there before Trump came on, along the scene. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's just remarkable that despite the, you know, the, the, the real problem today is the fossil fuel industry. I mean, everything else can be sort of said, all right, this is ideological differences of opinion and all. It all, all boils down to, uh, you know, uh, the fossil fuel industry. So just the other day, we had heard that the Koch brothers now want to put up huge, big, you know, campaign fund to stop all production of uh, mass transit systems in the country. They don't want buses, they don't want rails, they want nothing. And they're going to fight in every legislature and everything, in, everywhere in Congress. Now, why do they want to do it, you may ask? Is it they don't like buses, they don't like trains? No. They are the largest owners of oil refineries. And so when you see, it's an economic issue for them. If they lose their income from oil refineries that sell all their products to people who drive cars and all, they, they would be out of business themselves very soon. So you have to understand the dimensions of the problem. You, you know, we can sit around here and talk about where our differences are, how we can sit down and, and agree on things, and we can do all these various. You've got to look at the larger picture. And I think sometimes we do not do enough of it. We have this kind of a wonderfully naive way of thinking that everything will work out somehow. It doesn't work out that way. And I'm not trying to be cynical. I've been involved and engaged with the industry for many, many years. I mean, talking about the chemical industry, the oil refineries, I've been engaged in all those battles. So I have some scars from them. <laughs> but I know those, those guys are not going to go away anytime soon. So we have to call 
uh, you know, spade a spade on this issue. Yeah. And I, I, I think, Kareem, to, to follow up on that, that's why religious communities are so, so important in this. You know, the Koch brothers, uh, you know, kind of rule the state of Kansas along with, along with others. You know, I, my own denomination, American Baptist, we've, we've got 300 churches in Kansas. Now, most of them are very, are very small, and most of them are ultra, ultra conservatives. But, we, but we're re-energizing our American Baptist Creation Justice Network to try to get into congregations and to, to motivate them to speak from their moral, ethical, and spiritual, spiritual perspective. Because what Kareem is describing, what the Koch brothers is doing, is just immoral. It, it is absolutely hor horrendous. It is anti-religious. I, I won't, never mind. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you ask how is collaboration between the faith community and the scientific community going in Massachusetts, and I have mentioned, you know, that uh, we met for two days uh, at the uh, pastoral center, Cardinal O'Malley's headquarters, you know, with scientists and 50 or 60 interfaith leaders. And there was a tremendous amount of energy generated from that meeting, and I believe that that collaboration is essential here because I think uh, the faith community brings strength and perspective to this, but hearing a scientist who's been at Antarctica looking at the situation, telling you that if this happens, we're going to be underwater, has a little bit more impact than what a minister might say, and yet uh, I think we, you know, in the faith community can, can bring the moral and the justice uh, perspective to this that needs to be conveyed to move people to act. Uh, how that's going to develop, you know, is uh, we're working at it uh, day by day, you know, sitting around the table uh, with these folks um, uh, trying to figure out what the plan is. Uh, I think to have joint educational programs, uh, you know, uh, will be an excellent idea. Uh, right now we have a, a joint faith science uh, statement going around the state. We have about 600 signatories to it. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're building a framework within which to um, c communicate to people. So far, it's only been a, uh, a major press release, which did not get as much coverage as we had hoped. It was picked up by the Globe, it was picked up by the National Catholic Reporter, but <clears throat> not as much uh, as we would have liked. We're working on it. I, I just wanted to say a, a couple of words about uh, the, the, the second uh, keynote speaker from last night, and she suggested the idea of an eco-ethical arc, uh, because uh, we're at the point where what happened in the Old Testament is actually going to happen to us now, you know, uh, and we need an arc, but I mean, metaphorically speaking, clearly. But the important message that she gave is a very original thought. I never ever thought that we were in a position where we're not sitting around um, asking the terms of who, who won and who lost this battle. She said, we lost the battle already. We now need to negotiate with nature to see what terms they want to give us to live on this planet. I thought that was a wonderful statement. Leah, uh, you should be... <laughs> that was an incredibly original thought because really we have lost the battle. I mean, let's face it, we have not won the battle with nature. Nature has finally won with it. So the term of our defeat has to be now set, we, we have to sit down and work on a blueprint on that. And where, how do we then live in harmony with nature? I think that's the first thing. And a wonderful thing about this conference is that the person who's gonna be speaking next is Ibrahim Musa. And he's going to talk about Laudato Si. Now, anyone know what Laudato Si is? Yes. Okay, great. They know it's an encyclical. Pope Francis is an encyclical. And he is the first religious leader that has brought social justice and environmental justice together. If you want to build this eco-ethical arc, we have to listen to what Pope Francis had to say. So I'm just going to come up with one excerpt from his Laudato Si. 
Uh, and this is more talking about those of us who believe in saving nature should also care about the poor. But sometimes we forget in this discussion. This is from uh, paragraph 91. A sense of deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. It is clearly inconsistent to combat trafficking in endangered species while remaining completely indifferent to human uh, trafficking, unconcerned about the poor, or undertaking to destroy another human being deemed unwanted. This story reminds you about the migration issue that we're discussing now, about the way the children are being separated from their parents. This compromises the very meaning of our struggle for the sake of environment. It is no coincidence that in the canticle in which St. Francis praises God for his creatures, he goes on to say, quote, praise be to you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love, unquote. Everything is connected. Concern for the environment thus needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of society. That is what I call moral leadership. Francis does it over and over again. You have to just keep on reading it. One thing after the other. Most people just look at this thing as, oh, wow, I just read a couple of excerpts in the newspaper, it was the end of it. Read the document in entirety. I really commend all, all of you. Here is a voice, a prophetic voice of our times. And no one reads it. It's a shame. Anyway, you'll be telling us a few more things from an Islamic perspective, right, Ibrahim? So I'd like to hear that. Yeah. Marco, do you like to comment? Uh, sure. I, I think from, from my perspective, I look at it uh, from a practical point of view, is that we are willing to work with anybody that can help us to advance our mission of protecting human health and the environment. And as you just kind of referenced, they, they are one and the same, really. And in a lot of communities, uh, mosques and synagogues and churches and uh, what are other houses of worship, have tremendous standing in, in the communities still. I think especially when some of the other traditional organizations in life like civic organizations have broken down. It's all the more important to also go back to one of the other speakers who spoke as a chaplain about meeting people where they are, just going to people where they are. And we found that especially in Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford and places that are environmental justice communities that churches are tremendous allies in, in bridging that gap between scientists and just regular people because as scientists and engineers we speak this kind of arcane technical language and there's this really big danger that we can use all this stuff that sounds like gobbledygook to most people so if you can just go out and speak to people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups and explain what you're trying to do you can you can get them to understand what you're trying to do and, and it just brings to mind a little article in this morning's Globe that was talking about the latest report that came out about climate change and I don't even remember what it is there's one every day but at the end there was a scientist who said in my 30 years working on this issue the biggest change is we aren't talking about the future anymore we're talking about now and anybody who lived through the winter um, should realize this anybody you know, who's been to the Cape. Uh, I worked on coastal erosion cases for about 10 years. Let me tell you, it breaks my heart when I go to the Cape and see what's happened to those beaches. So um, I, I thought that was a plain English encapsul encapsulation of what's changed. Uh, what other people say is what used to be the best case scenario is now the worst case scenario, you know. Uh, and this is what John Holdren said a week ago. It's gotten worse than we thought it was going to get. Doesn't mean we can't respond to it, but we have to do it together and you know, have to do well, it boldly. What's very frightening for people who have looked at the climate change issue to just pick up, pick up on what you just said and what John Holdren had just said. All the scientists who have looked at the issue of climate change underestimated how severe the problem is going to be. They did not overstate their case. They weren't playing wolf-wolf with us. This is the, the tragic thing about it, is that look at all the 
projections of when the melting is going to happen, what, when the Arctic ice is going to go. Everything has gone beyond the first sudden deviation. We have been projecting it wrongly because we were trying not to look at nonlinear effects. Everything was linear. We didn't want to look at all the feedback loops that were occurring because we could not do, we, because that would have been overstating your case, right? So we tried to be conservative. We tried to be very conservative and turns out to be that we were erring on the side of being too conservative. Okay. Let's move to another question. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I have a statement and a question. So, you know, I'm an alumni, alum, alumni of <laughs> this institution, Hartford Seminary. Um, and, and I understand what you're saying about the faith communities, but I've over the years identified as a Buddhist, a Unitarian, an agnostic, and sometimes an atheist. And you know, the, so the question of faith is, is an active one for me, and I don't show up necessarily in congregations. So I hope that, you know, when we talk about people of faith and morality, that we really think about not just the three major uh, Judaic mm -hmm. religions. My other concern is that um, I live here in Hartford and I am in, I'm on the Hartford, Hartford's Environment Commission. I understand what it means to think locally and it seems like that's part of what we will need to survive. At the same time, though, I, I, the question is, how do we reach out to other countries across this planet who are so far ahead of the United States in terms of recognizing the problem and addressing it? Um, I probably can't answer that question completely, but I just want to say that um, I just returned a week ago from an international symposium put on by the uh, ecumenical patriarch, His All Holiness Bartholomew I. It was in Greece. And there the, the theme was for, um, towards a greener Attica, preserving the planet and its people. And it was seen as a, both a local and an inter, international. And there were 100 and 60, 60 people there, people from the UN and, and climate scientists and people of religion, all different religious faiths and, and so on and so forth. And that, that's imposing. And by, by the way, um, I, I'm a big fan of Pope Francis. But the ecumenical patriarch has been talking about this stuff for 30 years. Yep. He, has been, he has been the one who has been out front, way out front. On, on this. But anyway, I'm a Baptist, so yay for the Orthodox <laughs> as well. But, but this kind, these kinds of conversations need to happen all the time because it is both local and it's international. The refugee crisis, as we heard from the, high, the uh, director of the High Commission on, the UN High Commission on Refugees, he said, it is a flood now, and it is going to be an enormous flood of refugees. Greece has a million refugees. The total population in Greece is 11 million people. And, 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 so, and so how are we going to you know, man, manage, manage that? Do you manage your borders with compassion, as Philippe Leclerc said, or do you militarize it? And this is why we need to talk to other countries, because you know we want to militarize ours, or we have. Let's let's be honest. You know, let's be honest with it. So we just need to have these kinds of these kinds of conversations with a variety of different different perspectives, not just religious folks together or just scientific scientific folks. We had economists were there too, Jeffrey Sachs from the Earth Institute and Columbia University, and and other other economists. We need to bring all the, all these people together on a very regular basis, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, and to look at and to make sure we do not forget that. As let's see, I got the quote here: uh, a woman from Greece, from the World Human Forum. If you want to change the world, it will not come from the top down. Change comes from the bottom up. 
That's somebody, that's somebody from Greece, I'm sorry. I'd just like to ask a question. Which agency in the United States today is most concerned about climate change? Which federal agency? Did anyone Defense. venture a guess on this? Defense. Yeah. No, you're, not, you're not supposed to say anything. Oh, I'm not supposed to say anything. <laughs> no, yeah, the audience. That's right. The Defense Department. You know why? This is a national security issue. They understand. I've, you know, when we hold our annual conferences, NCSE, we have ten people from Pentagon come there, and they project about the number of environmental refugees that we will have to deal with. If you think the problem of refugees is a big issue now for Europe and the United States, just fast forward about 30 years from now, this will be a picnic compared to what people wonder. The whole subtropic and tropical area is going to be uninhabitable. I have relatives who live in Pakistan. They are living under uh, temperature of 120, 130 degrees almost daily. Many parts, they have major floods in the Indus Valley just two, three years ago. 14 million people were displaced. Where are all these people going to go? My question is, that's just one country. The same thing is true of India where there's a tremendous amount of heat waves going on. We're lucky we're living in a part of the world where we don't have those kind of heat waves yet. So that is a major issue. So you're right, we have to talk across national boundaries. This is not going to go, this is not going to go away, it's only going to get worse. In all the different sectors. Yeah. I mean, I think the question was how do we talk to the countries that are ahead of us in responding to this? And I don't have a good answer, but I do want to lift up the fact that the private sector is notwithstanding, and I agree completely about the fossil fuel industry, but the private sector is actually advancing Absolutely. progress more than Absolutely. government in the United States. Um, they're driving a lot of the renewable energy improvements. Um, you know, how do we work with countries that are ahead of us? I'm not sure, but you've probably read about the major offshore wind uh, projects that are that have been approved in Rhode Island and off the vineyard. They're being built by uh, European corporations. So there, there is, um, I'm sure, learning uh, that is uh, being exchanged, uh, you know, between American corporations and, and European corporations, uh, and, and in that and in that way, you know, uh, improvements are being made at a at a, at a non-governmental level. Yeah. No one has an answer right now, but part of my question was how do local people in the U.S. perhaps reach local people across the globe? So not necessarily relying on governments or on the private sector, but just local people who understand that we live on this planet and we're destroying our, our life. Okay. You know, and to and to make those, to try to put put that out as a possibility of locals reaching other locals, and, and from the idea. that bottom, that most bottom up right. way of let, dealing with this. Let me let me tell you about one one person. Oh, I got this report I just wrote yesterday for seventeen pages, but. Um, there, there is a, there was a fella, uh, Raj, uh, somebody who's working on a, a documentary, he's just about finished, with a documentary in which, oh, there it is. His, the, the, the docu, yeah, Raj Patel. Um, he's from uh, Texas, Texas A&M. He's working on a documentary and just about finished, finished with it. It's mostly Presby the Presbyterian Church is funding most, most of this. But what, what, he, what he did is he, he has gone to an African, an African village. I cannot remember the, which country the African village is. And they, they are being totally disrupted by climate change. Absolutely. And they're ev evangelical Christians. And then, he's, then he interviewed rural Wisconsin evangelical farmers. And, and then he, he brought the African, four people from Africa over to, um, to Wisconsin to have a conversation. And they're having this conversation, they both speak the same religious language, the evangelical kind of, kind of language. 
Um, but the Wisconsin, the, the Wisconsin says, well, there's, you know, the, I don't really believe in climate change. Besides, God will take care of everything because God's in charge. And of course, the African people are going, but our lives are being destroyed right now. <laughs> so that's, a, that's one example of local to local from, you know, world away. And, you know, a, a lot of us, we, we go on, you know, mission trips, whatever, whatever we call those, you know, to uh, over, overseas. Those are very local to very local. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. I just, would like just one example. To, yeah, I would like to take more questions so we, we can have like one or two comments from uh, the panelists uh, on each question. So you can choose whatever. Okay. So let's have Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Einstein said uh, when you're faced with a problem, you're not going to get out of it by using the same tools that got you there. Um, I applaud the use of local resources to rebuild a community in New Haven. Um, we got here um, with a series of um, financial instruments that destroyed the rural communities in the U.S. It's called the Adaptive Program for Agriculture. And then people like John Perkins who wrote the Confessions of an Economic Hitman uh, carried it worldwide. Um, this goes to the source of um, the immigration and to the source of the habitat destruction because the corporations that John Perkins fronted for uh, have taken the land that was released and done whatever. We buy bananas from um, United Fruit. I suggest that being local and taking Einstein into uh, account that we work as churches to get off the water-based sewage economy, um, that we think about uh, using things like charcoal, which we can make um, near or on the property of our churches um, for both heat and electrical power um, to, to as a as a filter, everyone knows about water filters that you screw on the tap. Well, that's a carbon filter. Um, you may not know about biochar, which is that filter which is filled with um, both um, nutrients and um, soil bacteria. But this is something that I'm. Um, encouraging you to make mistakes with. Uh, I, I'm really concerned that people have come here thinking that there is a magic bullet. And um, I don't think that solar energy is the only magic bullet. Um, but we definitely need to help local people to look carefully at what works there and get the state out of our hair and the, um, and the larger government out of our hair where they aren't needed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mark, would you like to comment on this? No. Well, uh, I know a little bit about biochar, but you know, you mentioned you mentioned a moment ago that private industry is moving ahead regardless of what the government may or may not be doing. And in many ways it's true. You mentioned solar energy is not the panacea. But there are many other kinds of renewables besides solar. And geothermal, there's uh, you know, gravitational uh, energy that can get, be marshaled from tidal waves and so forth. Now, What's happening in industry is very interesting. The biggest drawback for non-renewable right now is battery storage. And that technology is about to go through a major breakthrough. So the many projections made done by industry, hard-nosed industry economists believe that by the year 2030, 50% of the cars on our road will be electric. That is assuming current technology. But with the breakthroughs that are coming in uh, new 
technologies might in fact make that even come much sooner. You'll be able to charge your a car in a matter of minutes rather than hours. And, and you'll have a cruising range of six to 800 miles. So things are moving ahead, regardless of what we may or may not be wanting to do. There is something going on behind the scenes. And some of the small startup companies and some of the big companies are moving in that direction, whether we like it or not. We might still be saved, I don't know. But I don't want to put all my eggs in the technology basket. That much for I can say. Yeah. Yeah. We, we anyway. can. Yeah, we can take one more question and last. Yep. Yeah, that's that's good. If is it anyone? Okay. We we can conclude uh, uh, from you if you would like to conclude with a pay forward uh, to our session. I have a very brief word. Don't despair. That's yeah. all. Yeah, nice. Because yeah. I, I sometimes have to remind myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To quote one of my colleagues at the Environmental Prote Protection Agency, the, the way things can seem like big, huge, and insurmountable, but the way that you eat a, a cow is one bite at a time. So you just have to take things a little bit at a time and look for steady progress. I may be running out. Um, I, I don't have anything to, to add to what I said, but uh, I, I would uh, agree with what is said here. I think um, sometimes working with faith communities uh, can, can be a little bit uh, slower than we would like things to go. Really? <laughs> um, really? <laughs> And, and yet, uh, many times I, I have been, uh, you know, pleasantly uh, surprised. Um, the example I would give is that we have had um, pretty good success with solar PV on houses of worship. And uh, it's just one example, but it's my home church where um, it's in a very um, intellectually... Uh, <laughs> A prominent church. Everybody has PhDs in a lot of things. The church has a slate roof and a huge tree on the south lawn. And when we started talking about solar, I thought, I don't want to get involved in this because everybody says you can't do it on a slate roof. And somebody's going to say you have to chop the tree down on the south lawn, which people aren't going to want to do. And lo and behold, we have the, the, the solar PV up there and it's generating more electricity than the church needs. And we're now trying to figure out what to do with it. So um, yes, take it one day at a time, one project at a time. There is no silver bullet. That's why we have to work together. Christina, Christiana Figueres, who was the, uh, you know, the leader of the Paris negotiations in 2015, was at our, uh, was at that symposium, and you know, so many of the, it, it was, it was a reality check. It was, it was a reality check there. But there was also hopeful. And one of the things that she said, now is a Kairos moment. For those in the Christian tradition probably understand that. And, but, but now is that moment. Now, now is that, that moment. It's a moment of crisis. It's a dangerous opportunity, as we, in the Chinese language, is that we're, we're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> and at the same time, there's great possibilities. Yeah. Great possibilities. At the end, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Tom, uh, Vincent, uh, Karim, and Mark. And would like to thank you for listening. And we will have now a 15 minutes break, and we will come back uh, to our uh, present the presentation of our keynote, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Musa, at uh, 7:30. Uh, and now, if anyone would like to pray us, it's available. We we have a, a prayer place uh, in the chapel. If you would like to use uh, this place, thank you. Thank you. You see, see. My wife is